The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is George Orling from the Huntington's Disease Society of America, and I want to thank you for joining us today for the latest installment of the HGSA Research Webinar Series. Today, uh, I'm really excited to have Dr. Al Espada from the University of California at San Diego presenting his recent work on an exciting new potential target for Huntington's disease called PPAR Delta. Um, but before we get started, I just want to run through some logistics for folks that may be new to the research webinars or the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, everyone is on mute, um, but you can ask questions at any time during Dr. Laspada's presentation by typing it into the uh, questions box highlighted in what you should see on your menu. To the right, and at any point, we'll be uh, at the end of the Dr. Laspada's presentation. We'll ask him on your behalf. We are recording this, so just in case you have to dial off, there are other folks that would uh, appreciate listening to this. You can you can do this again by org and or clicking on the. YouTube icon in the upper right hand side where we have this research webinars archive. Just a couple of notes on our schedule. On May 12th, we'll have Dr. John FDA presenting on the perspectives of drug uh, This will be from 12 to 1 on May 12th. And uh, then we'll be actually not having a research webinar in June, but instead of make sure everyone can uh, join us if either at our convention in Baltimore from June 2nd through 4th, and actually on June 4th, 9 to 12 Eastern, we're having our annual forum, which will be webcast and broadcast for, for anyone to participate in. So uh, it brings me, as I said, great excitement to introduce Bada. Bada is Bachelor's of Science in Pennsylvania. Uh, he then went on to pursue a, uh, both his MD and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. While he was there, I've come to find out, which I, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know, that uh, Dr. Lispada, during his research, identified nucleotide repeat expansion in the androgen receptor. Uh, is linked to Kennedy's disease. Uh, after UPenn, Dr. Laspada moved on to the University of Washington for his residency, and he stayed there uh, and was promoted up the ranks to professor all the, and stayed there all the way through 2009. Uh, in 2009, Dr. Laspada accepted a position as a professor in division of genetics in the Department of Pediatrics and Molecular Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. And he's also founding faculty member of the UCSD Institute for Genomic Medicine. So uh, Dr. Lespot is here to present about a very exciting paper that was published out of his group in a uh, prestigious journal called Nature Medicine late last year uh, involving a protein called PPAR Delta and how it may be implicated in and may also be a drug target for HD. So with that, I'm going to... Show your. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So thank you, George, very much. And um, if there's a problem in terms of the projection of the slides or in um, hearing me, just um, you know, please come on and interrupt me so we can so we can rectify that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and have a chance to, um, to present our work to the Huntington's disease community. And so what I put together is a presentation where I was going to give a little bit of an introduction um, to Huntington's disease. I suspect most people are familiar with the history, um, but I think it's good to put things into a certain you know, historical perspective and, and, and put Huntington's disease in the context of, of the broader field of neurological disease research, because I think that's really important for therapy development, um, understanding how Huntington's disease 
you know, is closely related to a number of more common disorders such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Um, but how Huntington's disease is really, um, you know, a, a better disease to try and come up with a therapy for uh, because all the patients share a common um, genetic mutation. So let me just launch into it and um, I'll try to go not too quickly here, but not too slowly. So let me see. There we go. Okay. Um, so I think everyone knows that Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder and it's what we call autosomal dominant. So it's transmitted from parent to child. So when uh, an individual is affected, um, each of their children has a 50% risk of inheriting the disease. And something I think of historic significance is that Huntington's disease was the very first disorder to be localized to a chromosomal position using linkage analysis back in 1983. And I just want to point out that um, this work involved um, uh, studying many, many families who live in Venezuela along Lake Maracaibo. And this is an old picture of Nancy Wexler who was involved in this work uh, with this family tree of uh, nearly 10,000 individuals uh, that was written on paper back in the old days, um, very quaintly. Um, so, you know, uh, there's been an interest in Huntington's disease for decades and the recognition of its importance, and a number of people have been working on it, and I'm hoping that, you know, all that work is going to come to fruition in the next, hopefully, few years or decade with, with a meaningful treatment. That's what we're all interested in. Um, and just you know, this is uh, the headline when the disease gene was identified. It's, it's very dramatic, perhaps appropriately, um, in the New York Times back in 1993. And you can read it there, 10 back-breaking years in a research purgatory of false leads, failed experiments, and long stretches of mortem despair. An international team of scientists says it has discovered the most coveted treasure in molecular biology, the gene behind Huntington's disease. So that was 1993. And that was a turning point for research on this disease. And since then, we've been trying to figure out why, um, you know, the gene mutation causes neurons to die. And the gene mutation is an expansion of a CAG repeat in the DNA. And it's within what we call the coding region. So as everyone will remember from high school biology, um, DNA is the sort of the code. And then it is transcribed into RNA, which is the intermediate messenger and then the RNA provides the information to make proteins, and the proteins do, you know, a lot of the business uh, of life. Um, and uh, CAG is the codon for glutamine, and in Huntington's disease, patients make a protein, the Huntington protein that has too many glutamines. And in Huntington's disease, I think people recall also, hopefully, that, um, you know, we believe that once individual, an individual has 40 or more CAG repeats, they will get Huntington's disease. There's this intermediate zone of 36 to 39 where you can be symptomatic at an advanced age and 35 or less CAG repeats, people typically do not get Huntington's disease. And there also is this premutation range of 27 to 36 where um, you can have a family where no one's had Huntington's disease and it shows up for the first time. And then also this phenomenon of anticipation, uh, where the disease gets worse uh, as you go from parent to child because the repeat gets longer. Um, and so this is just some of the genetics that I wanted to review um, because, um, you know, I, I am trained as a clinical geneticist, so if people have any questions about the genetics of Huntington's disease, I'm happy to also field those questions um, as well. So. Uh, what we've come to appreciate is Huntington's disease is part of a category of diseases that we call CAG polyglutamine repeat diseases. We recognize nine of them, as shown here, and they share a number of features, uh, as indicated on the slide here. Um, so they all affect the nervous system. They're dominant disorders, and People usually are affected in, uh, as, as, uh, in middle age or young adults. Um, 
slowly progressive disorders, and then again this phenomenon of anticipation where the disease can get worse as it's transmitted from parent to child. That doesn't always happen, but it can happen. And for all these disorders, the only way you get the disease is by having a CAG repeat expansion in different genes. So in Huntington's disease, it's in the Huntington gene. In spinal and bulbar muscular atrophy, it's in the androgen receptor gene. And for all of these disorders, except for spinocerebellar ataxia type 6, the only way you get the disease is by having this specific type of mutation, a CAG repeat expansion. Okay, so patients with Huntington's disease have too many CAGs. Why is that bad? They make a protein with too many glutamines. Why is that bad? Well, the protein misfolds. And um, we believe that the initial step in the pathogenic cascade is the misfolding of the protein. And um, this occurs for all the different disorders at about the same size in the mid-30s. So once you get above the mid-30s, the protein misfolds. It adopts an abnormal conformation. It can't be degraded properly. It builds up in cells and neurons, and it causes disease. This is, um, I think, very well established um, for Huntington's disease. And the amazing thing, I think it's very important to appreciate this, is that about 20 years ago, we realized that um, this sort of problem where you make a protein that misfolds, and the misfolded protein can't be degraded and it builds up and forms what are called aggregates in neurons, um, that this is something that applies to all neurodegenerative disorders, whether they be really rare disorders, such as, you know, Jakob Kreutzfeld, you may, or, you know, you may have heard of mad cow disease, that's pretty, pretty rare, or the polyglutamine diseases, including HD, but also this very same type of pathology occurs in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, in each disease, it's a different protein, and the aggregates that are formed, you know, uh, look uh, you know, contain different proteins in them, but uh, the phenomenon is the same. And this is really important because it tells us that um, if we can come up with a way to deal with this issue, this problem of the misfolded protein accumulating, um, that we may have a treatment that would be effective not just for one of these diseases, but for all of them. So Huntington's disease is, share, is in a category of diseases you know, so it's, it's one of many diseases, um, some of which are much more common. And um, I think that's important because it provides, I think, impetus uh, to develop therapies uh, that will be applicable across the different diseases. And certainly that's the way many of us are thinking about this. Okay. And so, um, but just this is just to point out that Huntington's disease only affects a certain part of the central nervous system, and the, the different disorders that I showed you in the last slide affect different regions of the central nervous system. And another thing we try and do with our research is understand you know, why in Huntington's disease um, the movement control centers of the brain are um, preferentially affected, you know, more so than, for example, the part of the brain that controls coordination or, or muscle um, function. Um, and so that's another aspect of the research that's going on, not just in our lab, but in labs across the country, in fact, across the world. Um, okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to the research. This is, uh, um, you know, here in San Diego, but if you go 200 miles south of here and you're off the coast of Mexico, you can go swimming with the sharks. Um, but in this case, they're whale sharks. They're filter feeders. Um, so you have nothing to be afraid of. They're actually quite beautiful creatures, and I recommend it um, for if you're ever in Baja, California. Okay, so um, just again, Huntington's disease, just we'll, uh, to review just some of the basics again, an autosomal dominant disorder with a prevalence in Caucasian Europeans of about 1 in 8,000. It's a movement disorder, as I think everyone knows, where patients suffer from cognitive decline and sometimes have psychiatric problems. Onset is in the 30s, 40s, or 50s, typically. The region of the brain that's affected is um, the movement control center, and in particular, the striatum, which is very important for suppressing involuntary movement 
and there are specific neurons there, the medium spiny neurons that are particularly important for doing that. Another thing I want to point out that you can appreciate in this Venezuelan patient is um, patients with Huntington's disease have metabolic problems. They suffer mu muscle wasting, and it's well known that Huntington's disease patients have trouble gaining weight. And um, our research really uh, pinpointed this uh, uh, and uh, drew it, I think, in some more focus, uh, as you'll hear shortly. Um, but this was always uh, the case. It just wasn't appreciated because physicians were focusing on the neurological problems uh, appropriately because they can be debilitating. We talked about the genetics, how it's a CAG repeat disease, and we don't have a treatment yet, um, let alone a cure, but that's what we're all interested in. Okay, so, um, you know, with the Huntington protein, we try to understand, you know, what it's sort of interfering with in the cell so we can come up with a therapy. And the Huntington protein is actually expressed throughout the body in all cell types, not just in neurons. But yet neurons are selectively or preferentially vulnerable. And um, you know, we've done research over the last 20 plus years and we've seen that the mutant Huntington protein can interfere with many cellular processes. But I've highlighted two because these I think there's the strongest data for. And the one is a problem with the function of the mitochondria. Now you may not remember what mitochondria are, so very briefly, mitochondria are organelles in the cell and their job is to generate all the fuel for the cell. So they're basically the, um, the power factories of the cell. And so work was done even before the Huntington's disease gene was discovered to show that mitochondrial dysfunction occurs in Huntington's disease patients. I think the early work was done by individuals like Dr. Flint Beal, who's at Cornell in New York, um, and then work done by others. Now, when the disease gene was identified in 1993, we learned that the Huntington protein has to go into the nucleus to cause um, cells to become sick. And um, in the nucleus is where transcription occurs, where DNA is made into RNA. Um, the RNA is the intermediate, intermediate for coding proteins, as I mentioned earlier. And so we came to appreciate that a fragment of the Huntington protein can function as a transcription factor, and when it has a mutation where the polyglutamine <coughs> expansion track occurs, excuse me, then it interferes with transcription. And so we thought that was important for Huntington's disease pathogenesis. So we have these two processes that we think are most important for Huntington's disease at a cellular level. The dysfunction of mitochondria and the dysregulation of DNA to RNA transcription. The other thing I want to point out is um, in Huntington's disease research, we've been very fortunate. We've been able to make animal models, um, many different types, but in particular mice. And when we make Huntington's disease mice by introducing the human Huntington's disease mutation into mice, we get mice that really look a lot like human patients with Huntington's disease. They get motor control problems form these protein aggregates, they get muscle wasting, and they get you know, tremors, and uh, they uh, die an early death. Um, and these models have been very instrumental in our research, and we've been very fortunate that we've been able to derive mouse models that um, faithfully recapitulate many features of Huntington's disease. So, uh, Back in 2003, I had a very enterprising fellow, Patrick Waite, who's a neurologist, um, join my lab, and he was interested in Huntington's disease, and we came up with a project. Uh, we were going to test a, um, a drug as a therapy for Huntington's disease, uh, a cannabinoid, so a drug that would be related to marijuana, actually. Um, our body produces endogenous marijuana-like compounds, endocannabinoids. But I was concerned that the drug might affect the body temperature of the HD mice. And so this, this is, uh, so we, we were using these Huntington's disease mice and we decided, you know, I, I told Patrick that he should check the body temperature of the mice because I was worried that if, you know, there might be an effect on body temperature so we should get some baseline information. And we made a shocking discovery. So here, what you see, these are 
body temperature measurements on individual mice shown in different colors. Now, mice, like humans, like all mammals, we very tightly regulate our temperature. It should be around, you know, 37 degrees or so. Um, and what you see here is that sometimes many weeks before the mice died, um, their body temperature dropped and to very low levels. I mean, it's, you know, 30 degrees Celsius is very low. And this really never happens in mammals. Um, we tightly regulate body temperature. So this was an unexpected discovery, and I thought it must be important, and maybe it could tell us something about Huntington's disease. So we decided to, um, you know, to study it. And what you see is the problem with temperature regulation sort of begins around the time that the mice are having problems with um, their motor control. And um, what we learned is that the way mice regulate their body temperature is they have a special type of fat called brown fat that you can see here distributed out their body. And when cold is sensed in the brain, there's a sympathetic, so there's, there's basically hormones that are released that bind to brown fat cells. And then what happens is there's a production of a certain protein called PPAR gamma coactivator 1 alpha or PGC1 alpha. And the production of that protein leads to the production of two things really happen. Um, you get more mitochondria, and then you produce another protein, uncoupling protein 1. And um, again, there's a little biochemistry here that I would need to explain, but let me just make it very simple and say uncoupling protein 1, what it does is um, in the mitochondria, at the, the step where you're supposed to uh, generate energy, ATP, what it does is it, it sort of um, prevents that from happening by sort of uh, interfering with the chemical gradient and so then you don't generate energy but instead you have a futile cycle and you generate heat. And so that's how um, rodents thermoregulate. And so we decided we would study this and we saw that this was all disrupted in the Huntington's disease mice. And while this work was going on, Another researcher, Bruce Spiegelman, published a paper where what they did is they got rid of the PGC1 alpha gene in mice. They made what are called knockouts, where the mice didn't make this protein anymore. And those mice developed a number of phenotypes, but uh, when you looked at those mice, it appeared they had Huntington's disease. And that's what the paper argued, is that PGC1 alpha absence in mice equals a Huntington's disease-like phenotype and there was degeneration in the brain. So um, this work was published while we were doing our work, so we figured we were on to something um, because another group was sort of um, picking up on the same type of thing. And what we did is, um, so this is uh, what's called a microarray comparison, and each like um, column here is a different gene. And what we're doing is we're taking samples from the brains of patients with Huntington's disease. The grading scale is from 0 to 4. So 0 is before there's any problems. 1 is very early. 2 is early. 3 is more moderate. And 4 is late. And so we're taking brain samples and we're isolating what's called RNA. And we're measuring the level of gene expression. And what you see is that we have 26 different what are called targets of PGC1 alpha genes that this protein regulates. And um, you can appreciate there's uh, a lot of green in the HD patient samples, which means that these are coordinately downregulated. So we found some things in mice that suggested that PGC1 alpha wasn't working properly. And then we went to the human brain samples and compared control brain samples to HD patients early on or pre-symptomatic HD patients. And we found that the genes that PGC1 alpha is supposed to turn on are way down. And that told us that um, PGC1 alpha, a problem with PGC1 alpha may very much be part of what is responsible for Huntington's disease occurring. And this is something we published 10 years ago. So, um, so what we what was concluded then is um, by uh, Tim Greenemeyer when he thought about our work and published something in the New England Journal of Medicine, sort of summing it up a few months later, is that maybe what's going on in Huntington's disease is that PGC1 alpha isn't working properly, and that's why you get the mitochondrial dysfunction. 
So the nuclear transcription problem is PGC1-alpha, and that explains mostly the reason why the mitochondrial dysfunction uh, occurs that I explained earlier. So we thought that was uh, really exciting. And so our research over the last 10 years has attempted to pursue that and answer really two questions. And the first is, well, if PGC1-alpha function is impaired, um, can we, um, you know, can we make the Huntington's disease mice better by, you know, giving more PGC1-alpha? And so my former postdoc, Taiji Tsunami, who's now a professor in Japan, you know, led this work. And um, what we did is, again, uh, you know, a lot of this is complicated science, but I'll try to be very sort of um, clear in, in explaining it to you. What we did is we made mice that overexpressed PGC1-alpha, and um, we would, uh, the, the way we do this is what's called an inducible system, so we feed them a certain compound and it turns on the PGC1-alpha. And so what, and this is um, what's called the rotor rod. It's like a spinning log that we put the mice on to see how their movement coordination is. And here are normal mice in blue. And then the mice with Huntington's disease that have the increased PGC1-alpha, you can see they perform identically to our normal control mice as opposed to the HD mice that aren't getting um, you know, increased PGC1-alpha. And this is just where they're not getting um, the compound to turn it on. And um, we also saw that in other tests of motor function that the mice did um, really well and were significantly improved. So this sort of confirmed that PGC1-alpha um, dysfunction is important in Huntington's disease. And we also found that when you overexpress PGC1-alpha, you got rid of these protein aggregates that I talked about. So these are different brain sections, and we're staining the mutant Huntington protein that's forming aggregates with the antibody that um, shows up as green. And so you can see in the nuclei of these neurons all these aggregates accumulating. Um, but in the mice that overexpress, or we've given them more PGC1-alpha, those aggregates are gone. And uh, if we don't give them the inducer drug, you don't see the reduction of the aggregates. And also we did neuropathology, and we saw that this sort of aggregate removal also correlated with um, prevention of a loss of neurons in the movement control center, the striatum. Um, and so we published this work back in 2012 and um, showed that PGC1-alpha could rescue Huntington's disease. And the molecular details I won't bore you with, but the important thing is that we were able to validate that PGC1-alpha uh, really is involved in this disease. So then the question is why? So um, you know, why is PGC1-alpha um, a problem with PGC1-alpha causing Huntington's disease? And this work's been led by my postdoctoral fellow, Audrey Dickey, who's still in my lab. And um, if you recall, I told you that PGC1-alpha, that uh, it's short for PPAR gamma coactivator 1-alpha. And so um, that means that I want to tell you a little bit about what the PPARs are. So the PPARs are transcription factors. Now, um, again, remember transcription factors are proteins that go into the nucleus and they bind to DNA and they turn on the expression of genes. And the PPARs have been known about for over 30 years now, and there's three of them, PPAR alpha, PPAR delta, and PPAR gamma. And PPAR Alpha is involved in regulating fat metabolism. PPAR gamma also is very important in fat metabolism, actually is a target for drugs for diabetes. It's involved in insulin regulation and in fat cell um, regulation. And PPAR delta um, is uh, another PPAR that's been shown to be important in muscle. And um, our attention was drawn to PPAR delta because we learned um, that PPAR delta is highly expressed in the brain. And so we wondered if PPAR delta, you know, could be involved in Huntington's disease because it, it, ha it has this relationship with PGC1-alpha and where it relies on PGC1-alpha to work properly. And so we started to look into that. 
And one way you do this is you see if um, there is an interaction between the mutant Huntington protein and the PPAR delta protein. So if the idea here is that if PPAR delta is involved in Huntington's disease, does it have a relationship with the Huntington disease protein, HTT for short. And so what we're doing here is we're taking the brains of mice with Huntington's disease and we are doing what's called immunoprecipitation where we isolate the Huntington protein and then we look to see if the PPAR delta protein is in association with it. And it is, both in the mice with HD and also in normal mice, showing that this relationship between PPAR delta and Huntington also occurs normally. And if we do the experiment in reverse where we isolate the PPAR delta protein and then we look to see if the Huntington protein is associated with it, we see it's there. And we see both the mutant disease protein that's expanded as well as um, the normal protein in these um, Huntington's disease mice. And so then we, uh, we decided to say, well, okay, um, you know, we know that if we take neurons from the brains of Huntington's disease mice, that they get sick and they die. And you can see that the level of death is much higher in neurons from the Huntington's disease mice than in um, you know, normal mice. And we said, okay, well, let's, if, we, if we boost PPAR delta function by giving a drug that activates it, would that help? And sure enough, it did. It reduce, reduces the level of death. If we did this in another way and said, okay, well, let's give the neurons more PPAR delta by, um, you know, using a genetic trick to get more expressed, again, we see less death. And if we do the two things together, we see the greatest reduction in um, neuron cell death. So that told us that um, if we increase PPAR delta function, it can be neuroprotective. Uh, and so we've done a lot of experiments uh, using neurons from Huntington's disease mice to sort of show that this is the case. So the next thing we wanted to ask is sort of do this in the opposite way and said, well, we just showed you that um, if you boost PPAR delta function, that that's helpful. But then we wondered, well, if we, if we mucked up PPAR delta, if we, if we interfered with this function, you know, would that be bad? Um, and of course, again, we're using mice and we're, take, we're, we're putting a certain mutation into PPAR delta um, where it basically, it doesn't work anymore. And any PPAR delta that it comes in contact with, it makes it not work as well. So it's really like a poison pill for PPAR delta. And um, we do this in such a way where we can control where um, the poison pill is expressed um, using um, you know, a genetic tricks that uh, I won't go into using mice that have certain um, proteins that drive the expression of a certain protein that uh, you know, dictates where the poison pill is going to be expressed. And we do it where we are going to see the expression of the bad PPAR delta throughout the brain or just in the region that uh, is important for movement control of the striatum, those medium spiny neurons that I mentioned earlier. And when we express um, the, the mutant PPAR delta um, throughout the brain, we get phenotypes that are very reminiscent of Huntington's disease. There's a problem with coordination there's weight loss, there's a problem with muscle strength. And if we look in the brains of those mice now, you don't need to have gone to medical school to see that these brains are abnormal. So these are mice that are about 10 months old and you can see the level of degeneration is quite dramatic in the mice that are expressing this uh, PPAR delta poison pill, as I've called it. And then, you know, if you look in the cortex, you see a particular reduction. And, you know, again, this is just a lot of neuropathology where we're looking to sort of see um, if the brains uh, of these mice are sick, and, and they are, um, there is um, increased um, what's called gliosis, and there's a dropout of neurons, and even in the substantia nigra, um, there's a, a dropout of neurons. Um, so uh, mucking up PPAR delta really is, uh, is bad um, for the brain. And, and then if you consider the mice where we just expressed the bad PPAR delta in um, the striatum, uh, surprisingly that's enough um, to cause a problem that again looks like Huntington's disease, a problem with um, balance, a problem with um, you know, neurological function, a problem with motor coordination, a problem with muscle strength. 
And if we look at the striatum itself, we see that there is a death of neurons in the striatum um, just by expressing this um, bad version of PPAR delta there. And we did a number of other experiments, um, all of which suggested to us that PPAR delta, uh, when you uh, interfere with its function, uh, you get uh, phenotypes in mice that look a lot like Huntington's disease. So just to summarize this part, we showed you that the mutant Huntington protein interacts with PPAR delta, and that is a problem with PPAR delta function, and that we think contributes to Huntington's disease pathogenesis. Um, I tried to show you that PPAR delta is important for the function of neurons, because when we express this dominant negative poison pill version of PPAR delta, it's enough to cause a phenotypes that look like HD. And so our idea is that PPAR delta is an important target for therapy development for HD. So the obvious question is, well, do we have any compounds for turning on PPAR delta? That could be drugs to treat Huntington's disease, and we do. And um, we won't try and pronounce this long name, um, but the drug uh, goes by the shorter name of KD3010. And what's really interesting about KD3010 is it was developed by a company here in San Diego that's now defunct. Um, Calypsis, and it was developed um, as an idea to treat diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And the drug was developed and went to the FDA and was approved for use in humans. And indeed, a phase 1b clinical trial was completed where the drug was given to humans um, uh, for a month. And the drug was perfectly safe and well tolerated, and these patients did derive benefit in terms of their lipid um, uh, metabolism and cholesterol metabolism and glucose metabolism. Um, but um, for reasons uh, that really involve um, the drug not being more effective than existing therapies, it was dropped, and the company you know, has subsequently gone bankrupt. But we um, became aware of this drug because it's very potent and selective, and what we wanted to see, if it could rescue Huntington's disease toxicity, so here we're looking at mitochondrial function, and um, the lower uh, the level, the worse the function. And what you see here is that um, Huntington's disease neurons are dysfunctional compared to neurons from wild-type mice. But if you give this drug at very low, this is a very low concentration, by the way, nanomole or 0.3 nanomole, or you see a significant improvement. When we, when we make this drug, um, there's an organic chemistry aspect to this that I won't get into. It's complicated, but it, it exists in two sort of mirror images of one another. One mirror image is active, the other mirror image isn't, so that becomes a nice negative control for our experimentation. This doesn't help, only the, the one sort of um, proper confirmation works. And then what we did is we said, okay, well, will it get into the brain? So we took some mice and we injected it for a week at different sort of um, dosages. And remember, p part delta is a transcription factor, it turns on the expression of certain genes, so if it's working, um, then it should turn on the PPAR delta targets, and what you see is the expression of those targets go up. So that's at the stage for us to do what's called a preclinical trial. Um, and you know, preclinical trials um, are being performed by researchers across this country all the time, but um, there's been a concern about how carefully they're being done, and we really took that to heart, and we um, adhered to um, guidelines so that this would uh, be considered a rigorous preclinical trial. And, uh, you know, these guidelines are listed here, but this is something that um, uh, a number of investigators in the NIH have, uh, have emphasized as being important so that when people do this type of work, it can be reproduced. And so we did a, a preclinical trial where we took Huntington's disease mice and we treated them with this drug at that 50 gram. Um, per kilogram per day dose, and um, we gave vehicle to aging mice as a placebo, if you will, um, for mice, I guess. And uh, what you see is that in our neurological dysfunction scoring, um, you have an improvement in function, so the higher the score, the worse the function. In terms of the coordination task, you see a significant improvement um, compared to the HD mice, and you see a rescue of um, the loss of neurons in the brain, and you see a very significant extension in lifespan, 16%. And for this model, this HD mouse model, the N17182Q, it's very aggressive, and 16% lifespan extension is about the best 
that's been reported. Um, so that's a very encouraging result. Um, and we published this at the beginning of this year. And so KD3010 really worked well as a treatment for Huntington's disease in mice. But here's the really cool result um, that goes along with it. And this was work that was done by my collaborator, Dr. Christopher Ross at Hopkins. We sent him a, a couple of envelopes that were just labeled A, B, and C, and he renumbered them you know, based upon his numbering system. And um, in this experiment, he's taken skin cells from HD patients and made them into what are called stem cells, pluripotent stem cells. Um, and then you use those stem cells to make neurons, and he's made medium spiny neurons, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, are the neurons that are affected in the striatum. And what you see is um, when you treat with this compound, which um, is uh, 6475 here, you see a significant improvement in terms of preventing cell death. And in fact, it works as well as um, his most effective intervention, which is BDNF. It's a neurotrophic factor supplementation. Um, so Dr. Ross was very excited to generate this data. Um, so independent data from another lab in a different system using human uh, neurons that are derived from HD patient stem cells, uh, we also found KD3010 to be neuroprotective. And so, you know, there's a number of targets that we're going after, PGC1-alpha, PPAR delta, we have KD3010, We've, we're going to do more preclinical trials. Um, RxR, we have an agonist that we're testing for that. This is a, another transcription factor that sort of makes PPAR delta do its job well. And then there's um, another protein that we're interested in where we're trying to make compounds because this is involved in turning over bad proteins. And so um, K, the KD3010 work is moving forward and um, we are hoping that we can do a phase 2A clinical trial in HD patients, um, but um, we want to do more work in mice and do some other things in terms of toxicity testing because we need to go to the Food and Drug Administration to get permission to do this, and um, we're working toward that. My expectation is it'll take at least a year and a half until we're at that point where we could try KD3010 in human Huntington's disease patients. And so here's the group, and um, with that, I think I will stop and um, turn it over to George in case anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Al. So if anyone has questions, Alex, so you just mute your phone first. There's a bad echo. Um, so if anyone has to ask them now, I'll, I'll go ahead again. In, in relation to 3010, and you had mentioned that the, you want to go forward, what, how does that work along to Calypso? Who owns the IP around that account? Okay, so um, yeah, you're dropping in and out on me, but I think I got most of your question. So yeah, KD3010, as I pointed out, was created by Calypsis, and there's patents in place for KD3010 and KD3020 that go out to 2027. Now, when they went under, those patents went on the auction block, like sort of the eBay for, um, you know, for, for pharma, pharmacological, the, the, the pharmacological version of eBay. And um, a venture capital firm by the name of Tavistock purchased them. And uh, as it turns out, the biological um, sort of um, uh, the biological drug development um, arm of Tavistock is uh, it's headquartered in San Diego. So um, we've met with um, Tavistock a couple of times, and they're interested in seeing work go forward. Um, and they have the intellectual property. As a venture capital firm, I think what they're interested in is seeing, you know, um, uh, the compound be shown to be effective and, you know, de-risked, as the terminology is used, with the idea that then it would be sold to a larger pharmaceutical company. We have no intellectual property stake in the compound. We have no um, sort of conflict of interest. We don't stand, uh, we being, you know, the, the people who've been involved in this 
um, Katie Therity Tenwork or myself and Gavin Magnus and, and Tony Pinkerton, who are medicinal chemists at Sanford Burnham, Sanford Burnham Previce now, which is a research institute here close by in San Diego. So at this point, um, you have a compound that uh, is patented through 2027 with the option to have that patent extended because uh, if for a rare disease indication. So the intellectual property landscape is quite clear, um, but you know we have a venture capital firm um, who only wants to spend money on studies that are done on humans. Okay. Does that um, make sense? Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there evidence that the P part delta being decreased in HD patients? Being decreased in HD patients? In terms of protein levels, have you looked at that? Yeah, we've looked at that, and we don't see significant reductions in protein levels. But what we do see is we see that there is decreased occupancy at the targets of PPAR delta genes at their promoters. So PPAR delta, if you, and you're of course an expert on chromatin immunoprecipitation, as I recall. So we've done chip studies, and we see that um, in HD models. Uh, um, that um, both in mice and in you know cell lines and things like that, that PPAR delta occupancy is reduced at at, um, at at the target genes that we've looked at. Um, so our model is that um, PPAR delta is no longer gaining access you know to its targets, uh, and we think um, that this has to do with the problem with um, the interaction of PPAR delta with its um, co-regulators in a protein complex. And somehow the mutant Huntington protein is interfering with that. But when we put in agonist, that it sort of changes the balance of co-activators so that PPAR delta can get, engage you know, with its targets and drive the expression of its target genes in CNS. So that's sort of the model, OK? Great. Um. Okay, there's one question here from the community and saying, wondering if there's an expected delivery mechanism found in humans. I think they're wondering how, the, how you think this will be delivered. Would this be an orally delivered? Yeah, so, um, so I mentioned the phase 1B trial that was done. Um, basically, patients were given 40 or 80 milligrams of, um, of KP3010 PO, and they took it like once a day. And 80 milligrams was very well tolerated. Um, so I suspect that we can go much higher in terms of the oral dosage um, and to achieve, yeah, so and again, it's hard to, you know, translate from mouse to human, but I think we would need to, you know, go up two to four times that um, in an oral dose, but the, it would be oral. So it all has all been worked out by um, Calypsis. Um, they've come up with a drug that you can take by mouth and that uh, goes through the body and also crosses the blood-brain barrier. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question. It, it, the drug has profound effects in the HD mouse. Um, what can you, what do you, what's happening in terms of them exerting those through mitochondrial function, transcriptional dysregulation, the two mechanisms that you're keen on? or something else? So my view is that, um, to, that um, what's going on is that we are getting an improvement in mitochondrial function. We have additional data that we've generated subsequently um, doing biochemical studies actually with Ron Evans, um, who's listed on this slide, and his um, postdoc Wei Wei Fan, um, using the seahorse to look at oxidative, the oxygen consumption, et cetera. But um, what we think, we think two things are happening, and I, my feeling is these two things are very important for um, all neurodegenerative disorders, not just HD, and that is um, we're improving um, the energy production, we're making mitochondrial function better, and at the same time, we are also improving um, proteostasis and um, organelle quality control. And my view is those two things are, are um, tied together. You need energy to do protein and organelle quality control, 
and you need um, well-maintained mitochondria to generate energy. And we think that PPAR delta agonist treatment is improving energy production and improving protein and mitochondrial quality control. And basically, you know, my view in terms of this therapeutic intervention is um, the way I think about it is patients with Huntington's disease, they're expressing the mutant protein from when they're in their mother's womb. But yet, they go 30, 40, sometimes 50, even 60 years before they develop disease. Why? Well, it's because our neurons have come up with a system to ensure that energy production and protein and organelle quality control is really maintained optimally. Because you get your neurons when you're a fetus and those are the neurons you have for the rest of your life. There may be some production of new neurons from stem cells, but it's insignificant in comparison to allotment of neurons you get from when um, you know, those neurons are laid down as, as the baby and a child. Um, and those pathways function very optimally, but as we age, they decline. And so the therapeutic concept here is to boost the function of those pathways so that your neurons are you know, making these compensatory functions uh, you know, uh, maintained at a higher level so that your neurons are more like the neurons of a 30-year-old instead of a 50-year-old in terms of energy production and protein and organelle quality control. Um, so that's sort of the conceptual framework for the therapy. Thanks, Al. Um, one more question. I was intrigued by your diagram showing uh, that when PPAR delta and, and the retinoid receptor. Um, oh, RXR, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, RXR. Yeah. They can lead to increased <laughs> lipid cholesterol. Did you look at cholesterol levels in the treated mice? The reason I ask is I'm by Elena Catano's, uh, I think it's her, her work from her group suggesting that you may actually want to increase brain cholesterol levels. Yeah. I'm wondering if cholesterol increased with the treatment of this drug. Yeah, no, I, I'm familiar with Elena's work. Um, you know, we haven't um, looked at, um, at lipids and cholesterol in the brains of these mice. It's probably something we should do. It's probably something I should ask her for, to get some help with um, because she's an expert at it instead of reinventing the wheel. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, it's a good point, George. Uh, um, but, no, we haven't looked at it. Great. Thanks, Al. Sure. Um, I'm not seeing any further questions, and we're getting close to the end of the hour. I just want to thank you, Al, for your time putting together this great presentation. Uh, everyone online, thank you for joining us. As I said, this has been recorded this, and we'll put it online uh, in the coming days uh, for those who may have missed it. But thanks again, Al, and uh, I appreciate all that you've done and all that you continue to do for, for us, the HD community, and the patients and families suffering. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, well, you're very welcome, George. It's been a pleasure, and um, you know we're we're going to keep moving forward. And and you know between the work going on in our lab and in other labs, uh, I'm very hopeful that um, we will have some exciting therapies. Uh, being, well, already there are some being tested in patients. So I think um, you know it's an exciting time for HD research, and we're just going to keep pushing along here. So uh, thank you, everyone who joined in. I hope it was somewhat helpful to hear about this. Take care. That's great. Thank you, Al.